Thanks, uh, thanks, Rajat. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank the organizer, at least one who's sitting here, for inviting me. <laughs> Two? So inviting me to this conference and giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk. As uh, a trivia, I can tell you that this is the first work uh, which I managed to bring or lecture about in three continents. So it's uh, my pleasure to speak about this here. And apologies, by the way, to those of you who have already heard my talk somewhere else in the world. So what are we going to discuss today? So Lionel was saying a couple of days ago that essentially or nearly every talk in this workshop is starting by drawing this picture. So as probabilists or physicists interested in statistical mechanics problems, what we are trying to do are study microscopic systems uh, of which we can witness only microscopic interactions. So what we're doing is we are taking uh, our favorite graph, which most of the times is the square lattice, and then we are trying to put on this grid uh, some interacting particles or interacting systems, and then consider the system from far away and try to guess its uh, macroscopic properties. The point of this work, which is joined with my uh, PhD student in Delft, Bart van Hinkel, is to try to work or try to do statistical mechanics uh, in contexts uh, where you do not have reference grids uh, or reference graph, like canonical graphs, uh, where you can uh, do statistical mechanics, where you can study particle systems or interfaces for that matter. The title has, I think, two main keywords. One is the discrete Gaussian free field, which was already introduced at the beginning of this week. And the other one is precisely the setting in which I want to place myself, which is the setting of manifolds. I'm not going to do a lot of heavy differential geometry, so don't worry about that. So what do I want to study? I want to study interface models on manifolds. Just to recall briefly what interface models are in a very, very general setting. So interface models are random, I think of them as random separating surfaces between two different media or say states of matter. And they can have the most different shapes from one dimensional curves. This is an easy model at critical temperature. But you can go also to higher dimensional interfaces. For example, this is a simulation of the odometer of the divisible sand pile made by Jan de Graaf. And again, what we want to study is the microscopic behavior of these interfaces. And the interface that I want to study are a very narrow class, if you want, of all the possible interfaces. And they are all going to be Gaussian interfaces. There is a very nice and quick uh, definition that one can give of Gaussian interfaces. And we have already seen that uh, in uh, Rajat's talk, is to think of interfaces as simple multivariate Gaussian laws. So I'm starting by taking a multivariate Gaussian that is a collection of random heights, which in the classical context, so, so when I'm in ZD, I index over the square lattice, in particular a hypercubic box of dimension d with side length 2n. And to define the discrete Gaussian free field, we have seen that we can't do that by, without introducing what we have already seen in several talks, the discrete Laplacian. So the discrete Laplacian, which I take in this version as normalized, so simply the discrete differential operator that returns the average height of a lattice function f around a point x. Nothing more than that. And now what you can do is, by using this discrete operator, we recall, I should say, the definition of discrete Gaussian free field. So the DGFF is this 
this is a simulation or realization of this random surface. And here, the take home message from this long formula somehow are, are two essentially. So the first one is that you see that I have a law which is proportional to the exponential of what is called the Dirichlet energy. So the interface uh, times uh, its Laplacian. And the other take home message is that what I'm forcing the interface to do is I'm extending it from the hypercubic box to the whole of ZD by setting the heights to be equal, in this case, to zero outside of the box lambda. And this is not just done for, I don't know, aesthetic purposes because you want to have an interface on the whole space. But it's done also because this allows you to define this interface in a proper fashion. So with these particular boundary conditions outside of the box, in particular on the boundary of the box, you're allowed to say, OK, my interface, my multivariate Gaussian, it's well defined. In particular, it has a nice symmetric and positive definite covariance, covariance matrix. So it's a well defined model. This consideration brings me to another equivalent approach to the definition of discrete Gaussian free field, which is this very nice link between interfaces, in particular the DGFF, and the theory of PDEs. So since I want to define a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian, we know that all we need are its mean and its covariance. Due to the zero boundary conditions, the mean of this vector, random vector, is going to be the zero vector, so not much to say about it. But what you can say about the covariance matrix of the DGFF is that, as we have already seen, the covariance matrix G lambda is the Green's function of the discrete Laplacian. So it's the solution of a discrete boundary value problem where my G lambda starts to be zero outside of the box. This is due to the fact that I was setting my interface to be zero with probability one outside of lambda. This approach is somehow the one I would like to take and one can hope that such an idea, I try to define inverses of discrete operators, is going to tell me how to extend the definition of the DGFF to more general settings. Now, why do or does one want to study the DGFF or general interfaces for that matter? Well, the DGFF has a lot of applications just confined, say, to probability theory, there are many more, of course. So possibly the idea is try to say, OK, I have this object, not just on RD, I have it in more general settings. Can I, for example, try to work with these other, and there are many others, uh, objects, fields, quantities, random quantities, if I go beyond the Euclidean lattice? Now, the question, especially for those in the audience with a physical background, a physics background, is that I would be, I would like to know if indeed there are open questions or interesting themes that one can look at in the setting of, the setting that I'm going to introduce now, which are manifolds. So, at least before starting this project, personally, the only manifolds I had seen were the most simple ones, so the sphere and the torus, and that was it for me. But of course, if you open a book in, for example, differential geometry, you see that, or you go to Oberwolfach, you see that there are a lot of strange structures, geometric structures, that appear. In particular, you see that in these settings, at least, the space is not uniform around you. And this is one of the main obstacles that one has in trying to deal with the statistical mechanics of manifolds. So distances, for example, are distorted by curvature. You have holes that do not appear in Euclidean space. And due to this, you do not have translation invariance due to this uh, this homogeneity or inhomogeneity of space. 
So this leads to the problem of saying, OK, I want to define or I want to study a certain model on a manifold, which is the grid I have to start with. So even before defining your model, you need to understand what's the nature of replacement for ZD that I'm going to place. OK, yes, but not, say, not in general. Say, if you have, that's true. Some, some do have uh, nice properties, and you can say, for example, on the sphere, on, on the torus, that's more, I would say, natural. But if you try to talk about very, or general as much as you can, uh, sorry, manifolds, you do not have automatically this property. That's the, that's the issue somehow. So the manifolds that I would like to talk about, again, they are not the most general manifolds you can think of, but they are manifolds with these uh, four properties. So I'm studying somehow, I want to restrict myself to studying spaces which are bounded. So I want to be on a compact manifold, connected. That's somehow, I think, a quite natural requirement to ask. What is kind of important is that something I can't get away with is the notion of distance. So I'm trying to study Riemannian manifolds, that is manifolds that come already with a sort of built-in distance with them. So I know I have the notion of traveling between a point, so from a point to another on the manifold with a certain distance. This is something that I need to construct my models. And since we are, so we were trying to look in the literature about, uh, we were trying to look for grids that one can define on manifolds. But due to this problem that you don't really have directions uh, on a manifold of this type, as a probabilist, uh, we th or as probabilist, we thought, okay, let's just not study a specific grid, let's, uh, let us construct a random grid on the manifold and let's see if it works. So if I want to give you a graph on a manifold, I need to give you two things, so the set of points and the set of edges. And since you do not know where to start with the points, the first choice that we decided to make was to pick uniformly at random from the volume measure on the manifold M. This measure is finite because I'm in a compact space. So what I do is I sample uniformly at random a certain number of, say, n points from m. And this is going to be the vertex set of the random grid G that I'm going to construct. Now, given the dots, I need to tell you how to connect the dots. The most general form, which one can do also on ZD, is to say, OK, I take any two nodes, i and j, and I connect them with an edge. But this edge is going to be weighted. And the weight of the edge is a positive symmetric weight or conductance. So now I have, you have to imagine on this manifold you have a graph which is weighted. And with having this graph or this weighted graph, one can construct clearly a graph Laplacian. This graph Laplacian fixed the grid realization has a form which reminds us of what uh, we were seeing on uh, ZD, so where the weights were simply 1 over 2D, 1 over the number of neighbors, just tweaked somehow by this weight that I'm going to, that I'm going to choose. OK, this is the general form. I'm coming to a specific definition of the weights uh, IJ later. So I want to define the DGFF for very general graph Laplacians. Then I'm coming to a specific example. So for the moment, it's just the conductance. So OK, in this choice, what I'm going to decide is to say that all the WIJs are strictly positive for the reason that I want to construct a complete graph. I'm not saying that this is the most general form of random graphs you can have on the manifold, but what we are going to see is that to capture somehow the geometry of the manifold, at least in our problem, 
we need to be connected to every point, uh, to every sampled point uh, on, uh, on M. I will discuss about this later. So yes, so in this form, what I have is a complete graph. And OK, just one thing. I have this discrete Laplacian, so I can imagine that there is an associated random walk walking according to this uh, Laplacian on the graph, on the complete graph I have. And another uh, comment is that this graph, being on a compact manifold, does not have a natural boundary. So you can't think of an interior and an exterior if you are on M. So recalling the definition that I gave before of DGFF, which required somehow to define, to have the positive definiteness of the covariance matrix, to have zero boundary conditions somewhere, or at least a pinning in a site of the graph, one can ask the question, how can I define a discrete Gaussian free field on a graph, which is OK, weighted, but all the more that does not have a boundary, so where I can't put zero boundary conditions. There are many ways in which you can answer this question. The one that we decided to take, the route we decided to take, was the following. So essentially, the problem is the invertibility of the graph Laplacian. And the issue is that the graph Laplacian is not a nice object to invert because clearly on constant functions it's zero. So either you get away with that problem by forcing the interface to be zero somewhere, which is what you do typically in ZD, or you can be lazy somehow and say, OK, I decide to define a matrix, Gn, which is the inverse of, OK, that sign is correct, the Laplacian, or minus the inverse of the Laplacian, on functions which are non-constant, and put it at 0 otherwise. So somehow you reduce the problem of inverting this matrix to a smaller space, so a space with one dimension less, in which you are able, indeed, to define what is delta dn minus 1, which is going to be my matrix G. This matrix G now exists, is nice and positive, symmetric and positive definite, so again I can run my Gaussian interface. Sorry? Yes, yes. So this is the inverse of this weighted Laplacian, indeed. And OK, perfect, I have a mean vector, I have a covariance matrix, I can define the DGFF in this form. Now, this particular form of DGFF is called the zero average, discrete Gaussian free field, because due to the constraint that you are uh, inverting G or you're inverting delta on functions that are non-constant, your discrete average or the discrete average of the interface is going to be zero with probability one. And this is not, uh, I mean, we are doing no discovery here in the sense that this is a very classical technique that, uh, or definition that you can find, for example, in the book by Aldous and Phil on uh, Markov chains. And it has been applied uh, in uh, uh, this paper by Angela Becherly and by Rajat and his student Shreyan Das on uh, uh, the torus to study different problems concerning uh, the DGFF. So phi i is the height at i, and this is uh, yeah, the discrete average, so, which is going to be 0 with probability 1. OK, so I have this definition of 0 average DGFF. So far, so good. Now the question is, what can I do with that? What can I do with this kind of graph and this 0 average DGFF? Now, our question was, can we try, for instance, to take the scaling limit of this object, so sample more and more points, and rescale the weights in such a way that we're going to see something in the limit. And here, I need to specify the definition of the WIJs that I gave before. So from a very general setting, I'm going to something more specific. What are the ingredients of our weights WIJ? 
So I need two things. I need something which is called the PT. It's the heat kernel on the manifold. Now with those, for the manifolds I have just defined, you can define a heat kernel. So you can think that there is a Brownian motion going on uh, or running on this manifold according to these transition probabilities uh, PT, just like in uh, RD. And what I further need is to use a parameter t, which is actually going to be the time parameter of this running Brownian motion. And this parameter t I'm going to call the bandwidth. So this parameter t is actually something which is used in manifold learning, for example. And it's something quite typical that people use when they try to recover the structure of the manifold by sampling points from the manifold itself. This parameter is something that indeed comes from manifold learning and statistics. But for us, it's just, been, it's just going to be a time parameter that is being rescaled by the number of points that my grid has. Yes? OK, so you know the explicit form on PT on compact manifolds, Riemannian manifolds, is not known explicitly, at least for a complete class, for the complete class of manifolds. You do have bounds. I mean, what you try to do is to approximate it with the Gaussian, more or less, so e to the minus the Riemannian distance between points, a square, and so on. But no, you do not have an explicit form in full generality. Okay, and now what is my weight going to be? So I'm reading or I'm guiding you through this expression. So I'm putting above the heat kernel between the points i and j at time tn. I'm going to say later how I need to tune tn with respect to the n points. And below I have tn times n. So just to give you a brief heuristic I'm going to stress further later is that what I'm expecting is that to have a reasonable setting, to be in a reasonable setting, if I need to define a random walk through that graph Laplacian I gave you before, then what I at least want to have is convergence of the random walk to Brownian motion. And what you're expecting is somehow that is that these weights, which are driving your discrete process on the grid, are going to approach the heat kernel of the corresponding Brownian motion on M. That is why I have PT here. No why? Metric in nine J. Because I would expect that if you have Brownian motion on M, then you can reverse the trajectory and say that uh, this is PTJR. Yes, yes, it's a symmetric weight. <laughs> okay. No, you, you do need symmetry. So what uh, is going to change later? So probably, okay, I anticipate this problem. So you see, what we have to take into account uh, using these weights uh, is the following fact. Do you expect, uh, so Brownian motion should spend uh, around the point on the manifold uh, an amount of time which is roughly proportional to the area around that point. Uh, so on RD, the area around each point is the same uh, because space is flat. Uh, but you have to imagine that on a manifold you have space which is bending, right? Uh, so what you want to do is you want to tune the weights of your random walk in such a way that the time spent around the point is roughly proportional to the area around that point, which is exactly what the Brownian motion is supposed to do on M. Other questions? Yes? So the fact is, so. That was my mistake at the beginning too, not my mistake, but something that one has to take into account is that typically what you do when you study this thing as a torus is that you study the flat torus. So sort of topological torus where the boundaries are attached. But in this setting here, when you consider the torus, you really consider the donut. So you consider something when there is, where there is more space in the inner circle and less space, whatever that means, when you go towards the outer circle. 
So this construction works on a D or say ZD. So if you think that this is ZD, you can rerun the same construction and everything that I'm going to say later works on the flat torus too. But just uh, I'm considering not this grid, but a strange, uh, I'll say more unusual graph. Uh, okay, I'm not making all the connections like Lionel the other day, but you understand the point, I hope. Okay, some edge is probably missing, but okay, you understand that. So this is where I'm going to prove convergence of the GFF. Uh, sorry. No, it does, exactly. Yes, sorry, I didn't answer. It doesn't depend on the graph, it depends on the manifold. The random walk. So this random walk should approach Brownian motion on, say, a D. Even, so like in that case, like in the usual random walk scale in the mid. This is not obvious, but you can show it. Okay. All right, so scaling limits. So this is something that we saw already a bit in uh, Rajat and Violetta's talk. So the typical scaling limit, or what you're expecting to get when you scale the DGFF, uh, is a generalized Gaussian field. So it's a continuum structure which lives on the manifold, which has mean zero, and that, if you think of the usual definition of Gaussian fields, is something which has a certain covariance kernel, curly G. And in my case, what's the most natural thing to do is to think that curly G is the inverse, or minus the inverse, of what is called the Laplace Beltrami operator on M the analog of the Laplacian, but on the manifold M. Usual problem is that this object here is not defined on the diagonal, and therefore I need to talk about the generalized Gaussian fields, so random distributions that are constructed in this way. The, I need now to give the specific definition of Gaussian free field on a manifold, so the field which is associated to this curly G. And not much surprise here, I'm going to construct something which is called the zero average Gaussian free field. What I need, again, are some ingredients. I need a space of test functions. I have a random distribution, so I need to test it somewhere. It's a space of smooth function on M which have the zero average property. So I integrate them with respect to the volume measure and I get zero. So this is going to be the space of test functions. And the zero average GFF then is going to be a collection of random variables that I write as bracket XF, where F is indexed over W. So I don't have a pointwise defined field, but a function-wise defined field. Where now each one of these xf is Gaussian, so 1d Gaussian with mean zero, and variance given by the L2 manifold product between f and curly g applied to f. So in this sense, one has to think that the covariance kernel of the zero average Gaussian free field x is indeed the inverse of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And essentially what I'm defining here in this line is a random distribution which lives in the dual of W. X, F is actually the pairing, so the action of the dual space on W. And I just want to mention that this object is nothing, again, already existing object. For example, it has been used to construct what is called the Lugol quantum gravity on sphere and tori in D dimensions. And it's interesting because even before proving the scaling limit of the DGFF on a manifold, it has been used to show where the scaling limit of the dimer model on Riemann surfaces by uh, different uh, three groups, at least, uh, of people. So it's already an object which exists as scaling limit of some statistical mechanics models. 
this is the first theorem that we obtain. So the first theorem tells you the following. So I need to choose my parameter, my bandwidth parameter Tn, going to zero in a suitable, uh, at a suitable rate, which I'm not specifying. So if I force myself, or if I force my random walk somehow to jump according to this transition, or Brownian motion transition kernel, then if I rescale the DGFF by n to the minus a half, what I obtain almost surely in the realization of the grid points is convergence in law to the Gaussian free field, so to this zero average Gaussian free field on M. So this year we see that we have a discrete model which is consistent with the continuum limit that we are expecting to obtain. I'll show you the proof later, but at this stage, the typical question that I get, or we get asked, is the following. Do you really need to work with this specific model? Can you make uh, other generalization? Is a complete graph needed? Just talking about DGFFs on graphs, as I defined them before, we worked and came up with three conditions that ensure you that you do have, again, the scaling limit of DGFF to zero average GFF. The, I'm giving you a sequence of graphs now, be it random or deterministic, it doesn't matter. But what I want to have, so, okay, I have an associated Laplacian with respect to these uh, grids. And I know that the zero average DGFF is going to converge to the zero average GFF, provided you get these three conditions. So the first condition is quite natural. It's the condition that the empirical measure on the points of the grid is going to converge to the volume measure weekly. And this is somehow, again, the condition that you want your random walk, or Brownian motion for that matter, to spend a certain amount of time around the point which is proportional to the area, which is close, which is in a neighborhood at that point. So somehow you want your sampling points to really recover the volume measure of M. The second condition is a bit more technical, but again is or traces back to this idea that to have DGFF convergence, you need to have convergence of random walk to Brownian motion. Otherwise, you do not have any hope. So consider the semi-groups of the random walk driven by delta and D, and this S is, the, is Brownian motion. So you have your transition kernel for the Brownian motion on M, and you define for any W functions, so the set of test function, functions, their discretization. So F minus its discrete average. What we are asking is the following condition. So you want 1 over N, the inner product between Fn and the semigroup, the discrete semigroup acting at Fn, to converge to the corresponding continuum object. And behind this condition, we are seeing that in the proof, there is the idea that you want covariances for the DGFF to converge to the uh, Gaussian free field covariance. This is really the variance convergence that, you're, convergence that you're expecting when you take limits of Gaussians. The third convergence is actually the more puzzling, and we are still trying to exactly get a hang of it. So what we are requiring, we are requiring here a condition that the spectral gap of the discrete Laplacian is bounded away from zero uniformly in the number of sample points. So let me go to the comments about, okay, the first condition, this condition about the uh, empirical measure of convergence is indeed what I said before, so a sort of uniformity for the underlying stochastic processes on M. The second condition is a condition that tells you that covariances are going to converge. You're taking Gaussians, so you need covariances to converge in a sense that I'm going to specify in the proofs. As for the last one, the 
explanation that managed to convince us uh, came from uh, several papers which are written about the spectral clustering technique. So in spectral clustering, somehow, what you're trying to do is I give you a sequence of random points, and you want to group them together. And roughly, the way in which you do that is by recovering the continuum Laplacian from the discrete Laplacian on these points. Now, if you have a condition on the positivity of the spectral gap, what happens is that you are trying to be in a setting where you do have a manifold, indeed, which is connected, but doesn't have a dumbbell shape. So if you have something which has, say, too big, even thinner, bigger regions of mass and a thin corridor connecting the two. So here the spectral gap is indeed going to be positive. But what happens is that, or what I heuristically imagine happens, is that I'm going to sample a lot of points from the left, from the right pad, but a negligible amount of points in this thin corridor. And what this means is that essentially, I think, is that the random walk is going to spend a lot of time in the left half, in the right half, but it's not going to spend enough time in between to really capture the behavior or the structure of this whole manifold. If you're not convinced by this explanation, we need it in the proofs. So it's a technical condition we can't get away with. Now in the last 17 minutes, I want to give you an idea behind our proofs. So the first one is the following. So typically, when you try to prove convergence of the DGFF, or say any interface for that matter, to a continuum limit, you have to prove two things. You have to prove a finite dimensional convergence, and you have to prove tightness. What we realized is that, at least in this setting, when we are working on W, which is a space of very nice, smooth functions, you do not need to have tightness. So life is easier because in nuclear spaces, as for example the set of smooth functions on a manifold, all you need to do to prove convergence is to use characteristic functions. So you need to prove that characteristic functions of the, from the discrete side approach the continuum one. In particular, now if you recall the second condition I gave you, you have to study discrete L2 products and prove that they converge to their continuum counterpart. And this is where I'm going to use this convergence of semi-groups that I was showing before in the following sense. So here we are constructing a proof which is based on spectral theory. This is a proof that works in RD as well. Just in RD you can get away with easier things. So you want to prove essentially that the exponent here is converging to the exponent in the right hand side. So you take this exponent and then you realize that the Green's function of my model is the local time of the associated random walk. So it means it's the integral of the semi-group. And if you're allowed to swap expectations and integrals, and bring further the limit inside, what I'm going to get from the first line is the second line. And here you see that I want to study the limit of 1 over n fn, discrete semigroup applied to fn. To do this step, you actually require two things. So you require the empirical measure to converge to the volume measure, because you need somehow to bound this uh, uh, discrete uh, in your L2 products, and you need the spectral gap condition. So only under the spectral gap uh, uh, condition you are, are we able to bring the limit inside, and by using the second assumption, that is, this object in the limit is actually converging to that, and then by doing the reverse procedure from the continuum side, we recover the exponent that I had for the Gaussian free field.
So it's, a, I would say, quite neat proof, but it does indeed require to have spectral gap positivity, uniform spectral gap positivity at this stage. Given this proof, which is the proof of the very general theorem, remember that I had a definition of a sequence of random graphs which were complete and whose weights were given by, as a function of the transition kernel of Brownian motion. So since we have a general theorem, all we are left to do now is to check those three conditions, almost surely in the realization of the grid points, so these three conditions here, for our graph. So in fact, I must say that when we started this work, Bart, together with Frank Redich in his master thesis, had already thought about random grids on manifolds. And in the context, uh, so to go back to your question, the context in which had studied the random grids of manifolds was one where you didn't necessarily have complete graphs, so weight, uh, weights could also be zero. And he actually proved that for a very wide range of graph Laplacian or weighted graph Laplacians, you have something more than weak convergence of the empirical measure to the uniform measure, you actually have convergence in the W1, Wasserstein 1 distance as a function of the bandwidth parameter. So if your bandwidth parameter goes to zero, the W1 distance of the, between the empirical measure and the uniform measure goes to zero. So what does it mean? We are left with two conditions, semi-group convergence and convergence or bounds on the spectral gap. The unif the um, semi-group condition is actually something which comes quite naturally because you remember I always said that there is this random walk underlying random walk that I want to go to, that I want to make converge to Brownian motion. So the semi-group condition is recovered as long as I know that the discrete Laplacian is converging to the continuum, so to the laplace beltrami operator in a uniform sense over the grid points. So I want to say now that this delta nd is going to converge to the delta m for any test function f which is in w uniformly over the grid points. Now you see why the, this definition of weights is actually quite nice. So this is the definition of our weighted Laplacian. Since I know that the empirical measure is close to the uniform measure, I can approximate this one over n sum by an integral. Now you see that the fact that I have pt over t is quite convenient because pt over t is exactly, okay, here's a typo, I should have called it s of t, not p. So this is exactly taking st minus the identity over t at the function f. And this expression here is a quite well-known expression because if I take the limit as t goes to zero of this object here, I'm exactly recovering delta m. So the choice of the heat kernel in the weight was done so that the proof of convergence of the discrete Laplacian to the continuum one is somehow very natural, at least uh, is quite easy to be explained in a talk. I just want to mention that this proof here works uh, even if you take a more general class of weights. Uh, for example, they, have, they can be Lipschitz weights, uh, but it works, and it works even if you do not have a complete graph. What is a bit nastier to treat uh, with other weights is the positivity of the spectral gap. Here also suggestions are very welcome. So the approach that we are taking here is an approach which is coming from manifold learning. So as I said, when people are trying to study spectral clustering and try to recover discrete Laplacians, or sorry, Laplace Beltrami operators from discrete ones. So what we do is the following. So we argue in this way. So imagine that your bandwidth parameter T is fixed. Now, what you know is that the spectral gap, what you can prove is that the spectral gap of the discrete Laplacian is converging to the gap of this operator here as n goes to infinity, for t fixed. 
And again, the choice of the weight helps us because now if I take t going to zero, the gap of this operator is converging to the gap of the Laplace Beltrami operator. So what you are trying to do now is you, you would like to combine in a sort of diagonal argument, you want to say that t goes to zero in n in such a way that you can take a combined limit and prove that if this tn is tuned in a suitable rate, at a suitable rate, the gap of my discrete Laplacian is going to converge to a positive quantity and you're going to have a uniform bound from below on the gap itself. Now you have to be a bit careful because you remember that your points are realized according to a random fashion. So you need somehow to be careful that this convergence here is not destroying the convergence of the discrete Laplacian to the Laplace Beltrami that I had in the previous slide. But you can do that. And you can actually prove that those three conditions are satisfied almost surely in the realization of the uniformly sampled point you're done. The DGFF, after rescaling, converges to the GFF. And again, as I said, this proof would work for the RDs, just that, of course, it's, a, it's an overshooting. So actually, you can prove it. So the gap is the first eigenvalue, which is non-zero. But what I think would work under the same assumption is that you have the convergence of the whole spectrum. So there are conditions, uh, again, coming from, for example, this work by Belkin and Miyogi that tell you it's not just the first eigenvalue or second eigen non-zero eigenvalue that converges, but it's the whole spectrum. But again, this condition doesn't hold. You have to be careful with the bandwidth parameter. There are some regions that you may not catch uh, somehow if you're not uh, careful. And OK, I have still some time. OK, so this is the part that's more uh, addressed to the audience, because as far as I am concerned, I've seen uh, not so many problems of statistical mechanics on manifolds. So these are some questions that popped up in our mind as we were working. So the first one is the following, and came actually from several questions that I received the first time I gave this talk in, uh, in July in Buenos Aires. So what we're doing here is we're taking an interface, we define that at every point, and then we prove that we have convergence in this dual of uh, W. But typically what people do, say on this grid, is to say I have the value, say, of the GFF at the point here. Then I extend it, for example, in a small box around each grid point. I patch all these things together, and I obtain a piecewise constant distribution that I can test against test functions. So would this type of approximation also work? And actually what we have managed to prove recently is that if you do this kind of patching on the Voronoi tessellation that is generated by these uniformly sampled points, whatever the tessellation is going to look like, I hope, okay. Something like that. Probably not quite Voronoi, but so if you do it in this fashion, what you can actually get is a stronger type of convergence of the DGFF to GFF. Technically, it works in some negative Sobolev space, to be precise. But our question is, what are the minimal conditions you want to get for your extension of the DGFF to converge to a properly defined random distribution? Other questions, so you saw before that we were talking about dimer models. There are results on the dimer model proved to converge to the GFF on spheres and tori. Are there other models that have Gaussian or GFF fluctuations on manifolds? This I'm not uh, aware of. We have seen in other talks other types of interfaces. For example, the membrane model, it's natural to ask, does this strategy work 
also for other type of Gaussian interfaces. Do you get a continuum counterpart on M as well? And the last question was actually the most interesting for me, which is the following. So what is nice or what is different about manifolds compared to RD? Well, the fact is that on a manifold, for example, you have holes. So your model, your statistical mechanic model, is somehow allowed to go around space by cutting through holes. And if you look precisely at these results I mentioned on the dimer model, what happens is that in the dimer model, the convergence to the GFF is not, is just a part of the story. What you get is convergence to something which is called the compactified the GFF. So it's a GFF where you're also counting the number of times your interface is looping somehow around the hole. So it's an extra structure that you observe in on a manifold, but you can't see on RD because RD doesn't have holes. So the question is, can one get in the scaling limit these compactified GFF structures? So can I somehow count how many times uh, or if my statistical mechanics model is affected by holes uh, or not? Because I need a random walk to be defined, so I think that my weights have to be positive or non-negative because of that reason. So I need to have the rate of jump of the random walk from a place to another to be positive. But, sorry, I'm just, um, could be, the point is that, you see, to see these holes or to see, for example, the compactified GFF, you really need to see, so to go around loops. So you need to go or jump around edges, then come back and see how many times you can come back, or what's the law of, uh, of the coming back somehow. So I don't know if you can, okay, certainly you can play with the rates, but what I think is more important is the underlying graph structure. Yes. So you're forcing things to, uh, could be. We, no, 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 we haven't really thought about that. So you see, for example, a problem is that in this case, we have a complete graph. So loops are somehow trivial because they are just triangles. So that's one question that we have. The random graph we have is not enough, good enough to get compactified GFF because you can just walk around triangles and then you're immediately back. So it would need something probably more sophisticated. Okay, with 45 seconds, I'm done. So thank you very much for your attention.